basically today I wanted to give a small talk on how we can apply uh, GIS and remote sensing in uh, flood modeling. Just like I said, I'm uh, enthusiastic about uh, applications of GIS in uh, water and environment. And today I just want to give a short talk on how we can apply maybe GIS in uh, flood modeling. But in the process of doing all this, I'll also take you through on hydrological modeling and what hydrological modeling is all about the data needs because I'm quite sure some of the students may be here or even the participants, those who are not even students, might be maybe engaged in some uh, projects which could maybe require you to do some flood modeling. So basically, this is the outline of my presentation. So I will first of all take you through a brief history of uh, hydrological modeling. Then we'll try and discuss why we need to do uh, modeling instead of just maybe doing the traditional methods of doing scientific analysis. And I'll take you through a small uh, explanation of uh, the applications of flood modeling, then the limitations of modeling, then how you can define the purpose if you want to do maybe a flood modeling uh, exercise or research, and then data gathering for flood modeling. And then finally, we'll work on uh, flood modeling data. So in most of my presentation, what I'll be showing you will be uh, uh, outcomes from the research that I did in my master's thesis, where I was doing some flood modeling. So just to kick off, so a brief history of what hydrological modeling is all about. So basically, the science of hydrology began with the conceptualization of the hydrological uh, cycle. So that means in the past, we do not have the complex uh, modeling that we currently have, but we're just trying to conceptualize the hydrological cycle in terms of uh, how the water maybe changes state from uh, liquid uh, and sometimes snow, which is a uh, precipitation, or uh, we could have precipita precipitation in the form of snow or rainfall. So the change of state from rain and then when the rain hits the ground, how it percolates into the groundwater and then eventually flows into maybe the sea. And then the cycle again continues. So in the past, because we do not have uh, the computation power that we have currently, how we were solving hydrological problems was just by visualizing all these processes of the hydrological cycle from the condensation, uh, which is now the rain in terms of precipitation. And then you have surface runoff, uh, then this runoff percolates into the groundwater and then the groundwater flows into the seas and then you have again evaporation forming the clouds and then the cycle continues. So before uh, the discovery of maybe GIS and what we normally have now as uh, remote sensing in terms of satellites, this was how we were visualizing the hydrological cycle. But then gradually as societal interests were developing, the hydrology then evolved a little bit. And this was because of the immense pressure from the increasing demand from, let's say, people wanted to get safe water due to the increasing maybe population and also rapid urbanization that we are currently having in across the globe. And then also the increasing pressure to ensure sustainable and optimal utilization of the limited water resources. So because of this uh, changing interest, then hydrology started evolving. And then now with time, we had uh, this shifting into the thinking of a hydrological thinking when we are trying to apply now hydrological models. And this was mainly focused on quantitative uh, assessments. So when you talk of quantitative analysis, it means you're not only looking at the hydrological cycle in terms of uh, the precipitation or rainfall and the underground maybe percolation and how much condensation you have, but you're now trying to uh, quantitatively maybe calculate the water balance in terms of how much water is available, how much water can be extracted maybe from the groundwater, from the surface water uh, uh, recharge, and also from maybe precipitation if you're doing maybe rainwater harvesting. And you're also now trying to analyze what are the effects of hydro hydraulic heads. Now, when you talk of hydraulic heads, you're just trying to see uh, if you're doing maybe extraction of groundwater, how is this going to affect maybe nearby uh, wells or nearby water bodies? So you see now we have a, a slight shift from the traditional thinking of the hydrological cycle, and you're now trying to quantify the different components, the rainfall, infiltration, surface runoff, 
and eventually now the evaporation. So we are now trying to quantify all those by using models like the picture, the top picture on the top right, which I'm now trying to show you. So it means now we are not only thinking of the different components of the hydrological cycle, but we are now trying to compute the water balance, quantifying how much volumes of water we have in each of these uh, uh, maybe components of the water balance. And then now you try to simulate, uh, in case you are maybe having scenarios, you try to simulate this over time and see how you can optimize this for maybe uh, water abstraction. But then the major issue in this case was how you do the modeling, because you are trying now to quantify these effects and trying to simulate, like you can see the picture at the bottom right here. So the top row, these green values are actually rainfall. And then the graphs at the bottom is like um, the discharge measurements uh, on a river. So, and then you can see you have uh, one graph in blue and then you have another graph in red. So the red graph is actually uh, th the results of a model. So you're trying to come up to maybe characterize the water balance and try to simulate the river flow so that you can try to maybe simulate how the river will be varying with the changing rainfall patterns at the top. And then now this, you're now trying to quantify the volumes of water because from this, water measurements, you can be able to quantify how much water will be flowing inside the river channel. Now, um, still thinking about how hydrological modeling was evolving. Currently, now we are focusing more on qualitative analysis, because right now we are having issues to do with the quality of water. If, if it is groundwater, most of it is saline. And uh, we're also having the dwindling, maybe the water volumes are, the water quality is really being affected maybe by uh, excessive droughts and then you're having salination. So right now we are more interested in uh, qualitative analysis of the hydrological cycle. And that is in terms of pollution of surface water by maybe point and diffuse. Uh, an example of a diffuse uh, pollutant is agriculture. And you can also have maybe groundwater pollution due to spills and industrial activities. So these pictures are just now trying to show you currently, this is now how we are taking hydrological modeling. We are taking actually an integrated approach so that now we are trying to look at the quality of that water in terms of uh, trying to analyze all the aspects of uh, economy, uh, environment, and at the same time meeting the needs of the future as well as the current, that is to say, sustainable maybe development or harnessing of this water resources. So anytime at the current moment, if you think of hydrological modeling, you are thinking in a holistic view where you're trying to incorporate all these aspects, environment, uh, economic issues, and also maybe how the society will be affected, the current society and the future. That is to ensure sustainability of uh, supply of drinking water, you want to irrigate your farms, like you can see in the pictures there. And uh, that is now the current steps that we have. We are doing, trying to do analysis of the uh, hydrological modeling, but in terms of qualitative analysis. Now, with the development of computer science and uh, earth observation uh, technology in the past decades, uh, this has really transformed the way we are now handling maybe hydrological modeling. Because currently we have a lot of uh, satellite missions which continually take um, near real-time images of the Earth's surface. And using these images, you can use these satellite images as inputs into hydrological models. So you'll see that some of these satellite missions, they can give you uh, satellite products that you can use for maybe quantifying precipitation. So you don't really need to go to a place to get uh, rainfall data of the place, but you can now resort to using satellite data. Another way to look at this is that you can uh, do modeling at a large spatial scale, especially when you're talking of uh, complex issues or issues that cover a very wide area, especially Africa droughts. We have droughts which could be covering a very large area. So with the development of uh, computer science and data observations, you can be able to analyze uh, droughts at a global scale, at a regional scale, if you're looking at it in terms of maybe 
uh, a, a, a given number of countries. You can also look at it in terms of maybe continental scale. You look at the whole of Africa or maybe a section of Africa, maybe the Horn of Africa. So using satellites, you can be able to analyze data at a very large spatial scale, meaning very wide regions, as opposed to the past where you could only analyze a very small area of which you have the data. Now, another way in which computer science and that observation has transformed the way we do uh, hydrological modeling is in terms of uh, the temporal scales. We can now analyze hydrological models at very large temporal scales. Now, when you talk of temporal scales, this means you can be able to, because the satellites, they normally orbit the Earth at a given time scale, time span. So because of the number of uh, satellites and also the repeat times of these satellites at a given uh, place, you can be able to analyze a certain region over very small durations of times, maybe three days or six days, and you can be able to analyze such information and use the data from these satellites as inputs into your hydrological models. So due to all this, hydrologists have analyzed systems and processes in a more detailed manner than before. Because you can imagine if you can be able to view uh, a specific area, a specific region, for instance, nowadays what we have is the use of drones. And these drones, you can be able to pass the drone over a river and get very uh, detailed resolution of this river terrain. So because of this, you can be able to analyze and give very fine input data into your models. Therefore, you do a more detailed analysis. For instance, this image on the right is showing us the effects of DEM resolution. Now, in GIS, I think we've already covered some of the basics in GIS uh, during the course. A DEM simply stands for digital elevation model, which is now one of the inputs that you put into the hydrological model which will now give you the flow of water, be it percolation or runoff. So the DM is very important to characterize how the water flow, you can see on the diagram at the bottom right, you are seeing the direction maybe of a river flow to the left, another direction downwards. So the smaller the resolution, the more uh, descriptive your model can be. Like you can see at the bottom, uh, right image, you have a bigger number of arrows, which can be able to show very tiny river flows or even maybe surface water flows within your model. So this is how maybe uh, GIS and that observation has revolutionized the way we do um, hydrological modeling and more specifically flood modeling because of the scales that you're using. Now, another way in which uh, this has helped is with the smaller computation time, time steps, we have smaller computation time steps. So this can be seen by, uh, we see we have very many different satellite missions. We have Sentinel, we have uh, Landsat 8, we have Sentinel 6, we have, so each of these uh, missions has got a given repeat time. And if you want to analyze maybe data in an interval of one day for the past maybe 20 years, then you would go for a given satellite mission that can be able to give you uh, this sort of information so that you can use uh, those satellite uh, images for your input. So you can even analyze data at a very small time span. And another way of reducing this time is by using uh, maybe drones. If you have a drone, you can easily fly it over an area and get the images for that area over very short durations of time. And you can use these ones as your inputs for your model. Now, why do we need to do modeling? This is now the important question. Why don't we just sit down and then do analysis of uh, your catchment, maybe do some flood modeling if you want to analyze flood in a city? Why don't we just sit down and then do it in terms of uh, reports, write maybe a 20 page document? Why do we need to use a model? This is because Hydrology and water resource engineering are subjects of very great importance for people and the environment. Because if you look at flooding within a city, it is going to impact on very many issues. Livelihoods, some people are going to lose maybe property, you're going to lose maybe uh, others are going to get injured. So if you want to 
resolve and maybe reduce all these impacts of maybe let's say a flood, then a good way of doing this by, is by using flood modeling. And a flood model, like the image at the bottom, this is another example of simulation of a river flow, where at the top here, the blue graph, these are actually uh, precipitation levels. And then what you have here, the graph, are simulations of, as you can see on the legend, you have soil moisture, uh, basing on the uh, pre prevailing soil moisture conditions. We are trying now to simulate the flow of a river let's say in a given channel. And you can see the soil moisture there on the graph is 0 0.97, 0 0.98 and 0 0.99. So you can model the soil moisture conditions and try to see if the soil moisture, maybe the soil is dry, how much flood is going to be created. If let's say a uh, rainfall of a very large intensity was to rain and the previous night you also had very high rainfalls, it means the soil moisture would be a bit higher. And then you're trying to simulate what would be the damage, what would be the extent of the flood, how many buildings would be covered. So because you're going actually to simulate this flow of the water using these graphs, and they, you can be able now to advise maybe farmers who are living close to that area. Or if it is you're looking at it in terms of a town, you can be able to advise uh, in terms of evacuation processes how many estates are going to be impacted, how many households are going to be impacted. So using a model, you can be able to show this very accurately and uh, very easily to even a layman. Now, um, some distinct examples of how we apply hydrological modeling is, for example, in flood control. So you can use models to do flood control. You can also apply models for water supply this could be both surface water and groundwater, trying to quantify how much water is flowing on the river and how much water is flowing maybe into the uh, groundwater for groundwater recharge and how much volume of water is in the ground. You could also do modeling for wastewater treatments, how the water is treated, how this impacts on uh, uh, maybe uh, pollution into a nearby uh, river or whichever surface water that you're looking at. Another form of doing hydrological model is in irrigation and drainage. Now, in modeling for irrigation and drainage, you're trying now to simulate the soil moisture conditions and trying to see how this will impact maybe on crop development and even the yield of the farm. So you can be able to advise uh, farmers on when to irrigate the land, when to maybe do cropping, just by analyzing uh, the soil moisture conditions, which is also a domain of hydrological modeling. You can also do erosion and sediment control. How much erosion is maybe going into a river or how many maybe landslides, uh, what is the extent of a landslide? You can be able to simulate this and be, be able to maybe do disaster or risk management. Another dis uh, distinct uh, application of hydrological modeling is in pollution reduction. Where you can be able to simulate how the pollutants will be flowing, let's say, in the water resource, which could be uh, the star, which is a river, a lake, or even the ocean. Or you can even do a more complex study in terms of looking at it in pollution of groundwater. And then you do this model, modeling to see how much poll pollution is going to happen. Now, uh, now we go a bit more into flood modeling. Uh, the previous slides they were just giving you an overview of hydrological modeling, but right now we want to go now into the uh, flood modeling in detail. And as I mentioned before, most of the illustrations that I'm going to use are based on the research that I did in a region in uh, the Netherlands. But basically, the same same method and the same criteria can also be used in other regions just to do maybe flood simulations and flood modeling. So. What are some of the applications of flood modeling? So the first one, you want to simulate. You want to simulate how much flood extent you're going to have and what areas are going to be uh, maybe flooded and for how, uh, for maybe for how many days or what is the duration of this flooding? Is it going to be, is the flooding just going to ha happen maybe for one second and then disappear or is it going to last maybe two or three days? So the best way to do this is by using uh, model 
simulations. And here again, you are having uh, at the top rainfall data which you feed into your model. And then you try to simulate the river flow. And you can see here at the bottom legend, you have a time scale. So if you are to do some early warning systems, you would be able to warn the people maybe here where you have the peaks of the river flow. That's when you're going to have maybe flood scenarios. And you can actually be able to show this in the next slide you're going to see, you can be able to transform it from the graphs into a map. We are not only showing the volumes of water, but you can also now show this in terms of maps showing the extent of areas that are going to be covered. But the most important thing when you're doing any modeling, you should have, you should do calibration and model validation. Now I'm going to explain what calibration is and what validation is in the slides that uh, come next. So you can also do, uh, you can use hydrological models to do uh, forecasting. So here in this case, we are seeing some maps and these maps, the one at the top left is showing us a flood extent for rainfall with a return period of twice in one year. So what is happening here, you, you've done some maybe statistical analysis to qu quantify how much rainfall, the probability of a given rain happening. And then you feed this volume of water or this, uh, this maybe amount of rainfall into your model. And then now we simulate the blue line here is the river. And then now we simulate the flood extent from that river. And you can see here the shaded regions and the, the extent is showing you how much areas of that place will be flooded if you had a rainfall with a return period of twice in one year. So this is, you're doing flood modeling, modeling for extreme rain events which have not yet happened, but you're now trying to simulate this to see how much areas will be affected and what would actually be the depth. So the map on the top right is showing you flood extent for rainfall with a return period of two years. You see now a rainfall of return period of two years, you have a much larger extent which is being covered. And maybe just a point to note, uh, this project that we were doing, most of these areas were farm areas. And so what was happening here was that um, the farmers were suing the water board which manages the river. So they were complaining that because of this river flowing close to their farms, when you have rains, then this uh, rainfall uh, causes flooding from the river into their farms and then destroys their crops. So because of this, uh, the water company uh, appointed uh, the students within our university, which was the University of Twente, to try to simulate this so that we could see if they change the river uh, flow regime by changing maybe the direction of the river, the river channel. If you change all this, what would be the extent of the floods? And then now we do the flood scenarios for different rain events. And then we advise the water company on maybe which flow regime of the, uh, or which change in direction of the river they should be able to adopt so as to minimize flooding of nearby uh, farmlands. And you can see at the bottom left, you're having now flood extent rainfall with a return period of 10 years. So in this case, now you're having larger areas being flooded and red is actually a flood depth of one meter. You can imagine a flood depth of one meter. That means if I was standing, maybe it would reach at my belly point. So that means that would be a very large flood. If it was to flood a farm, then you'd have all the crops in that area maybe dying off because of lack of oxygen and also because of water logging. And then now you have another simulation where you're doing a forecasting. Supposing you had a rainfall with a return period of 50 years, what would be the flood extents? You can see the flooding is more pronounced within that area. So that is another application of uh, hydrological modeling. You can be able to forecast the floods. If you have maybe different rainfall or different rain events, extreme rain events, maybe two year return period, you can be able to simulate what would be the extent. So how do you define uh, the purpose of a flood modeling effort? So the first thing that you need to do is you establish a flood modeling purpose and objectives. Are you doing the flood modeling maybe for a water company? Are you doing the flood modeling for uh, agricultural purposes? Or are you doing a flood modeling scenario for urban, urban development or maybe urban or regional planning of a town or a new uh, 
let's say, a developing area. But regardless of whatever you're doing, you have to consider the water catchment characteristics, which is rainfall. You have to do maybe the hydrological modeling, how this rainfall is going to recharge the rivers. And then how this water feed it, being fed into the rivers from the rain is going to maybe spill over or overflow and then cause inundation or flooding. So in uh, GIS and remote sensing, when you talk of inundation, basically is just to show what areas are totally submerged or underwater. So that is called inundation. And then you also try to simulate what is the exposure or vulnerability uh, of the people within that area. And you also may be trying to do some forest protection scenario. So those are the different analysis that you can do for flood modeling. It could be for just a simple hydrological modeling. You could be doing it for forest protection. You could be doing it to analyze exposure and vulnerability maybe of people, of households, of uh, maybe irrigation or, or maybe agricultural practices. Or you simply want to show how much areas have been inundated and for what durations. In all this flooding or modeling uh, exercise that you do before starting any of this or any of the design of a flood modeling, you need to ask yourself some basic questions like uh, what is the application of the model? Is it going for a scientific journal? Is it for an engineering management, maybe urban development? So this gives you uh, how complex your model should be. If it is simply to warn maybe villagers, you cannot make the complex uh, make a complex model, but if you're doing a flood modeling for a scientific journal, then you need to make it a bit more complex. Now, another question that you need to ask yourself is, what do you want to learn from that model? Are you doing it maybe for urban development uh, or uh, risk management, or, or maybe just for your academic uh, uh, thesis? Or what do you want to learn from that model? And then you also need to ask yourself, what questions do you want the model to answer? Are you trying to answer just simply flood extents, what areas will be flooded? Or do you want to go further and show for what maybe, what would be the duration of this flood? How, much, how long is it going to flood that particular area? And then you also ask yourself, what is the complexity warranted? And this will be guided by the purpose of uh, your modeling exercise. And then what data is available? Now, we are going to see that when you're doing modeling, it requires a large amount of data because all models are data-driven. So you have to ask yourself, are you going to be able to get all this data that you need, which are going to serve as inputs for your flood modeling uh, exercise? And then you also ask yourself, is a model exercise the best way to answer the question? Because sometimes if uh, the question is not so complex, there's no need of punishing yourself doing numerous simulations, numerous calculations to do a model when you can easily show this using a simple map. So there's really no uh, specific uh, sequence that you're supposed to ask yourself these questions. That is why I, I used this form of representation, meaning you can just try to analyze these questions and see how you can answer them and then how you can feed these answers into your model. Now we go into uh, data gathering for model flood modeling effort. So what kinds of data do you need? So a model which is applied to simulate hydrological pr process such as a flood must be calibrated and validated. Now, when you talk of calibration, you remember at the start of the presentation, I showed some slides showing uh, river flow and some uh, uh, precipitation data. And then you try to simulate the flow of that river as accurately as possible. So when you're doing this, you're training your model to simulate the river flow as accurately as possible using already existing in situ or uh, um, we can say field measurements you are doing what you call model calibration. You are training your model to give as accurate results as possible. 
And then once you do your calibration, when you're getting acceptable results, then you need to validate your model. That means you take another maybe rainfall event and then you try to simulate. So this rainfall event will be for a different period. Maybe the calibration period you can use, uh, let's say 2020, the year rainfall, uh, which was occurring in 2020. And then for validation, you can look for another rainy or uh, flooded season in 2021. And then you try to see the calibrated model. Is it going to give you accurate results or is it going to give you a result which is a simulation, uh, which is acceptable? Then if, if it gives you an, accept, an acceptable result, then you say you validated. So to validate, this means you need ground measurements or what we call in GIS in situ measurements, which could be rainfall data, which could also be uh, uh, water level measurements from a river. So you need to have this uh, field measurements. And so once you do this, you can use your model to do predictive, uh, you are trying to assess the predictive capability of that model. Is it able to predict an occurrence of a given flood? Then you also, by calibrating and validating, you are trying to show what is the accuracy of that model. Normally we say all models are wrong, but if you make your accuracy as uh, within the acceptable standards, we normally have some uh, standards that we use, we normally call them, uh, there's some form of, uh, uh, normally when you're doing your flood modeling, you have to use some of this. One of them is called the relative volume error. You try to see what error you're getting. If it is acceptable, then you say your model is accurate. And it, if it can also uh, simulate the river measurements accurately, then you can now say your model is reliable because the simulation that is going to make can be used for decision making, maybe policy making, or even awareness creation. So by calibrating and validation, you also, you also show the reliability of your model. Now, this is the downside of uh, modeling, because uh, in most cases, it is very difficult to get reliable and sufficient data, especially here in Africa, where you are having river measurement, you don't have river measurements, some areas you don't have rainfall data for that area. So data is very scarce because, the, because there's no field measurements. And so uh, this is because it is very expensive to do field data collection. And it, also, it is also very labor intensive. So this is true for most parts of Africa. But now the, uh, the upcoming of uh, let's say remotely sensed data is trying to solve this issue of uh, expense and but now the the other problem is uh, skilled personnel who can be able to analyze such information people who are gis uh, maybe gis technicals it is very difficult to come across so when you're doing flood modeling these are the data that you need as input data for your model you need rainfall data and you could collect data for the duration that you need. If it is for climate change uh, analysis, then you need rainfall data for a very long period of time. And then you analyze this data and you use it as your input. You also need stream or river gauge measurements. So as I mentioned, uh, most of what I'm presenting is based from uh, research that I did for my thesis. And so on the picture here, you can see this was my supervisor. So what you're doing here, there's a river. And this device that is lifting is an automatic uh, uh, river gauge measurement that does automatic registration of the river measurements and then records this after every five minutes. So you need some stream or river gauge measurements. And you can see some of this technology, uh, we have not yet invested in Africa. We still rely on uh, using the traditional rain gauge measurements which are not very accurate because when you send some of, somebody in the field he or she can just sit somewhere and then guess some river gauge measurements but if you use automated registration levels then you get accurate river gauge measurements now another important set of data that you need for your model is soil moisture data and then basically the soil moisture data you also have automatic 
this picture, the second picture, which I'm trying to show using red cursor is an example of a device that also has automatic measurement of the soil moisture and then relays this information and records it at every five minutes. So the next image is actually a um, uh, rain gauge that is showing, uh, is, is collecting also the rainfall and also automatically registering this. But still, you cannot really rely on these automated processes. So at some point, you need to go into the field. So you can see in the image that is myself, I was collecting some soil moisture data, which you now use for calibration and validation of your model. So the last image there is just showing you how you can be able now to download uh, the automatic uh, recorded information from the soil moisture measurement device onto a laptop. So those are some of the in situ or field measurements that you need, rainfall data, river measurements, and soil moisture. And these pictures are just trying to show you how this data can be collected for input into your models. Now, other data types that you need, you need a digital elevation model, which you normally call a DEM. So this image, the top right, is an example of a DEM for that area. And this will help you to characterize maybe the topography of the area. And also, it will help you to do what we call stream, uh, stream flow uh, annotation so that you can see which are the major rivers, which are the minor rivers, and what will be the direction of water within the area. You also need subsoil parameters, which you can get from soil texture maps. So these subsoil parameters could be things like uh, hydraulic conductivity, so that you can show what will be the porosity of the soil, and then you input this into your model. You need land use or land cover maps. So the image here in the middle is a land use and land cover map, because basically the land use and land cover will influence how the flood will be flowing maybe on the surface and will also influence percolation. Like if you have a tarmac, like this black is tarmac, you can see here you have a small black strip. That means along the tarmac, you are bound to have no percolation into the ground. But if you have maybe, let's say, a forest area, it means you're going to have a lot of obstruction, and therefore it is going to act as a buffer for flooding. So you also need this, and then you input them uh, as input into your model. Then finally, you need river channel characteristics. This could be the width, uh, how wide the river is, what is the depth of the river, what is the roughness of the channel walls, and so on. So what are some of the limitations of flood modeling? As you can see, it is not so simple. It is a bit sophisticated. So that's why we are saying sophisticated graphical modules. It is also very complex because you need to check for correctness. And to do this, you need to do model calibration and validation, which is both time consuming and very uh, tiresome and also very complex. Then, as you've seen in the data that I've shown you, models are data driven. Without any data, you cannot do proper modeling. And then finally, they require high computational and processing computers. That means you must have a computer that can be able to handle the model. Most of these models, if you use a computer, for instance, a P1 computer, it will simply crash and it will not be able to do any analysis. So you need a very high speed computer with a very big RAM, like let's say 16 GB RAM, which could be maybe comp uh, expensive and also difficult to get. Uh, but all in all, um, this is now a summary or a form of conclusion. There are some advantages to using hydrological models. So the first one is that you'll have enhanced computational convenience and far, because you can analyze data for a very big Area. You remember I said using models, you can do global modeling of floods. So you can be able to do, uh, you can do more complex or uh, uh, wider computation as, as opposed to when you're doing this manually. Then it also enhances hydrological model. You saw when I was showing you the data, it means for the particular catchment that you're trying to do the modeling, you need to understand the land use, you need to understand the soils, you need to understand what is the rainfall in that area. So by so doing, you get a more deep understanding of the hydrological characteristics of that given 
catchment and this helps you in maybe making informed decisions maybe for policy making and also other uh, purposes and uh, it also enhances data capture capacity you can be able to capture data for uh, large data and, and be able to store this in databases and finally it enables continual improvement in the accuracy of solutions if you're doing maybe flood modeling for the purpose of uh, uh, town design or urban development you can be able to do this accurately or if it is for agricultural uh, or maybe disaster preparedness you can always keep on improving because you're collecting data for a very large period of time and i think that marks the end of uh, that lengthy uh, presentation so thank you maybe if there are any questions like maybe at this point thank you very much simon we really appreciate it thank you for a very very well prepared presentation and uh, we um, are now indeed open for questions um, so i would love to ask you to please use the reaction tools at the bottom of the screen to attract um, our attention to you if you have a question you're also welcome to um, ask your questions in the chat or just wave at us. We will do our best to, to pick um, everybody up that would like to ask a question. Um, I see that Benson asked a question in the chat. Benson, are, are you still live at the moment with us? Maret, could you see him? I was just wondering if he would perhaps like to ask his question live while Simon is online and with us. I don't see him, unfortunately. Maybe he's going to come back in. There he is. He's coming back in now. OK, um, I'm going to hang on a bit. Perhaps he joins us now, then we can. So in the meantime, I see that Samuel is asking, are the sessions for practical? um well the, the course yeah what i would like to to draw your attention to is the is the course by by Sion, um the south african environmental Obs observation network that is available to all of you with practical work and examples the and then clinic. also the mapping clinic that's ha or happening again on the 8th of april where you can um ask jonathan gatwood to demonstrate any particular G, uh, gis problem that that you might have so i see um Marit is kindly sharing for us all the links in the chat that you can that you might need to um have access to the um, say on course as well as the software that you need thanks for that for that Marit. And I see and Zolo is asking, can we get the details of the presenter, especially the um, email? I missed that part if he, sh if he showed them. Um, Simon, that is up to you if you want to share your email. <laughs> you are, I'm going to leave that to, up to you to decide. Otherwise, if um, and Zolo, if you have specific questions, you're welcome to send it to admin at sharescreenafrica.org and we can direct it to the presenter that might be best suited to your question. And once again, please join us on the 8th of April where you will have um, the opportunity to ask questions to Jonathan Gatwood and he's, you know, very capable to um, demonstrate to you how to handle that issue um, in GIS. Right, there we have a actual question related to the handling of data. What is what size? What is the size of in situ data required for flood modeling? Um, Simon, there's a question for you. Yeah, yes. So thank you. I think that's yeah, yeah. Change if I'm pronouncing correct. So basically, when you're talking of in situ data, this would depend on is it rainfall data or is it soil moist? because if it is soil moisture it would be very difficult maybe for you to get uh, in situ data let's say for every day maybe you can decide and use uh, 10 day data soil moisture data 
But if you're looking at it in terms of uh, the crucial data types like rainfall, then you need uh, more data. For instance, uh, water level measurements, you might need maybe daily measurements. So maybe the guiding principle there would be what is the objective of your flood modeling exercise. If it is, uh, if it needs to be very accurate, then you need maybe let's say the worst that you can have could be daily measurements, maybe of rainfall or uh, rain gauge measurements. But you can also have it as fine, like I said in my project, we are collecting this data after every five minutes, but that is too small. So if you can get the finer the data, the, the in situ data that you have, the better it is. But normally, daily measurements, for instance, for rainfall and uh, rain gauge and, and uh, water level measurements are sufficient. And then for aspects like soil moisture, this would depend on how frequent you can be able to go into the field and get this. But I think daily measurements is sufficient, but then this is subject to the objective of your study and also the scale. If you're looking at it at a global scale, then that means you do not need very fine data. But if you're looking at a very small project, then you need a smaller time interval. So this would be guided by the objective or or maybe the availability of that data. So the objective of your maybe research or your flood modeling and the availability of this data, I think that would be sufficient. I don't know if that answers. Thanks so much. Yes, does that answer your question? Do you have a follow-up question on that? I'm assuming you're okay with that answer. Um, Samuel is asking in the chat, what are some of the free sources of rainfall temperature uh, data? How is it? How easy is it to obtain DEM data? What GIS tools are important for hydrological modeling? There's a lot of questions in there. Um, Simon, you are welcome to go ahead. Just uh, unmuting you there. Yes. Yeah. So thank you. So maybe I can give you one. Uh, let me see if I can just be able to send you one of the good data that you can use is called Glovis USGS. This gives you access to most of the satellite missions and you can be able to download. I don't know if I'm able to share my screen, then probably I could be able to show this. Let me just see. Ah, yes. Yeah. So maybe I'll just show this. So one of the, one of uh, uh, the data that you can use to obtain, for instance, also digital elevation models is called Globis USGS, and you can just go online and be able to access this. Maybe I'll share this link with you on the chat window, then you'll be able to see this. So I've just shared the link on the chat window, and you'll see that from this website, you can be able to, once you, but you need, first of all, to log in. So that means you need to create account with them and it is all the data here is free. Once you sign in and uh, create a profile, you can be able to log in here and access the information. So let me just see if I can be able to log in. Thanks, Simon, yeah. that is fantastic. Yes, yeah, so from that you can be able to download also the digital elevation model and all those sorts of data that someone was asking, like rainfall, you can be able to get satellite products that will give you rainfall data, but then you need to be very proficient in earth observation for you to extract that information. Yes. That is um, valuable information. Thank you. Um, Benson is asking, is it possible to get rainfall var variability data? I'm doing my master's degree, but I'm suffering here in Uganda looking for annual rainfall data, templates, minimum and maximum. Thank you. So I think also you can also be able to get such data. And one good website where you can be able to get uh, information, especially on rainfall for Africa region is, uh, it's called WAP. WAP or I don't know if I'm W-A-P-O-R, it's a website 
developed by IHE Delft in the Netherlands. So from there, you can be able to download uh, a lot of, uh, let me just see if I can also. So it's called WAPOR. So let me just see if I can be able to get this. So from WAPOR website, you can also be, you can also, it's developed by FAO in collaboration with IHE Delft. And from there, you can get a lot of data on rainfall and other forms of uh, data that you may need, especially for Africa. So this would be a good starting point for you. You can, but you also need to log in and sign in. It's also your friends, so you can be able to get a lot of data from this website. So I'll also just share the link to the site there so that you can be able to access that. That's that's very valuable. A lot of um, practical tips coming through this afternoon of where to find data sets. That's fantastic. Um, I would also just like to mention there is a student that's asking at the moment um, that messaged me to ask if we will be offering a certificate um, at the end of the course. So what we can do is we can offer you a letter of attendance or a certificate of attendance. But we are not a, as, as such, Share Screen Africa is not a registered training institute. We are a learning resource for other universities and we connect universities with experts and experts with um, experience such as Simon. So we don't want to compete with universities and colleges at all. Um, but just to point out, when it comes to the IT industry and GIS, definitely forms part of the IT industry. Your employers are very much interested in your capabilities and what you have done and what projects you have worked on and what work experience you can show. So even somebody like the first presenter, Rion Laram, who's got an environmental degree and master's degree, but he's never formally uh, enrolled in any GIS course, but by now he's taught the GIS at university level without any formal training himself. So it's just to show that in the IT related industries, the way that employers look at things are a little bit different than other industries. There is a question again, what statistical knowledge do you require for flat modeling? Well, basically, it means you need to know about uh, hydrology. You need to understand the water cycle. So some training in water resources, either it could be water resource management or water engineering. And then now when you want to do the modeling in GIS, then you need now the GIS skills so that you can be able to apply the water resource or the hydrological concepts into the GIS model. So. Maybe one would be you need water resources management skills. It, this could be in terms of a water resources related cause or water engineering. And then now you now need the GIS uh, practical skills to do the analysis of this in terms of evaluating the different maps that you're going to use as your inputs for the model. So you see that it's, it's, actually, it's actually an integration of so many skills, water resources, hydrology, GIS, some IT, because you also need to do some coding. If you're doing the complex models, you need to know some IT because you're going to do some complex coding like Python. So all those are some of the knowledge that you need for you to do that. So it's a, it's a truly interdisciplinary um, discipline. Yes, I think that's the best way to summarize up. It is interdisciplinary, not one particular. Yeah, like I mentioned myself, I'm um, water engineering and then I have a GIS. So we see the combination of water engineering and GIS. So inside water engineering, you have all those IT and uh, coding and all those factors. And then now the GIS so it combines all this. Yeah, it, it is what makes it interesting and challenging. It, it, it's, it's a pleasant, um, uh, field to work in if you have the kind of mental makeup that can handle all these this interdisciplinary um, issues. Yeah. yeah, but the good thing is that nowadays we have a lot of collaborations, so you don't need to know all this. You can always work with 
different expertise and then you only handle your area of interest and then somebody does like if you need the coding you look for an it specialist you need hydrology you look for hydrologists so that is the beauty of all of all this because you don't work in isolation you work with different experts then you integrate all this knowledge to get your modeling skills um, Simon, I see in the chat there is another question. If possible, can I get someone from you to keep guiding me? So, yeah, this is this is a difficult question for me to answer because, as such, Share Screen Africa um, do not necessarily uh, we don't ha necessarily have the capacity to do one-on-one -on -one modeling uh, or, or mentoring. But what I do know is that at the very first meeting, the students started a WhatsApp group. So if Benson, maybe if somebody can maybe just include and make sure that Benson is on that WhatsApp group. And we can also perhaps from our side investigate if we can on the long run um, do something for postgrad students later on with specific questions but at this stage this is what this is what we do we link experts with classes anybody else any other questions simon thank you very much for this afternoon i really appreciate your time i think we are coming to the end of the session if i don't um, see any hands at the moment and then I would just like to thank you and um, would like to invite and remind all the students to please attend the next session on the 8th of April with Jonathan Gatwood please bring your session your um, your questions and attend that session thank you very much I see no further questions so Simon, thank you very much, and we're going to greet you and say goodbye until next time.